This week, I'm throwing, trimming, and assembling these small, spouted, pouring vessels. These are forms I've wanted to have a go at creating for a very long time, and as I don't exactly know what sort of shape and dimension I want to make these to, I'll be throwing a few different variants, throwing a variety of spouts, and then assembling them as best I can to figure out what works best in terms of both the visuals and the function. As always, this process begins with centering a lump of clay. I tried making two smaller variants from about one pound of clay, which is 453 grams, and then I made one larger one from a pound and a half of clay, which is about 680 grams. This small, solid disc of clay will be opened up and the outer, thicker section will then be pulled higher and higher, the shape formed and the neck collared in to form a small angular vase shape, onto which I'll be attaching a small thrown spout. I make sure the corner and the bottom of the pot is a sharp right angle, and only then do I begin to pull the walls up, which I do initially in a cone shape like this, because, as you'll see next, when you pull the walls up, naturally they'll want to flare out, and in doing so the clay will stretch, and if it flares out too much, it can be quite difficult to bring that clay back in again. So when I'm making vases or cylindrical pieces, I make sure to collar in the clay regularly as it just helps to keep everything under control. Between every pull, I douse the walls in water just to make sure they're hydrated so that my hands can slide up the walls easily without any friction. Ideally, I want the clay to flow smoothly through the gap between my fingers rather than stick to them. For the final few pulls, I use my index finger to really push in at the bottom. This pushes some of that excess clay up into the walls, and then I can lift the bulge it creates upward. And as this was my first time throwing this shape, my throwing is perhaps a little bit inefficient at times. I slowly ease the walls out to the point I want them, but I make sure to leave enough clay in this top section in order to be able to collar it in like so to form the shoulder, neck, and rim. For these pots, I want them to have three distinct angles. I want the lower half to taper in slightly towards the bottom, then I want the shoulder to slope in, and finally I want the lip and rim section to slope outwards again, sort of mimicking the angle the lower section of the vase has. The rim at this point was undulating a bit too much for my liking, and so I just steadily hold the potter's needle and slice away the wobbly rim. I don't mind sometimes if the tops of my pots do have a slight undulation, but for shapes like this it can be quite distracting, especially when throwing them. Before the opening is made too narrow, I then use a sponge on a stick to remove all of the excess water from inside the vase so that it isn't trapped in a pool covering the base of the pot. As if the water is left down there, overnight especially, it can cause the bottom of the pot to become very sodden and even disintegrate. But once removed, I can continue throwing the neck and forming the rim, which is quite delicate fingertip throwing really. I then did one last pull of the shoulder and the rim, just to correct their shape slightly. And once that's done, I can begin to go through the finishing procedures in order to get this pot off the wheel. And that begins by removing this skim of clay from around the base. Doing so means I can tuck the very corner of this metal kidney very close to the bottom of the form. I then run this sharp metal edge over the surface of the pot, removing as much of the excess slip as I can, starting on the lower section, then the shoulder, and finally the neck and the rim. On the upper sections, I can push the walls of clay out from the inside against the metal kidney, which typically leaves a neater surface, whereas I can't quite reach my fingers inside to do this for the body section of the pot. But I'll be trimming these all over, and I'll be able to remove those subtle throwing rings towards the top. Finally, I wire off the pot and very carefully lift it away and place it onto one of the wear boards waiting to my right. Next, I'll throw a slightly larger one. I want to make the same shape, but one that's a bit more narrow and slender. I begin by slapping down the clay onto a very thin skim of stoneware that's left over from the previous pot. As long as that clay isn't covered in water or slip, it'll help the next ball of clay stick very firmly down. Whereas if I was to throw this same lump of clay onto the wheel head when it was covered in water, it would just hydroplane and slide off. Throughout this beginning process, which is called centering, if I feel like there's any friction between my hands and the lump of clay, I'll scoop up some water and dump it onto the stoneware, or I'll drag my hand over the top of the wheel head, scooping up all the slip and water and deposit it on the lump of clay in the middle. Simply put, 
The idea is to get the play spinning as centrally as possible without any undulations or inconsistencies in it whatsoever. The next part of this process is pulling the walls up, which is done gradually in a number of pulls, as if you were to attempt to do it all at once. The walls would just collapse. Once the height is there, the pot is roughly shaped, water is removed from the inside, and then once again I'll go through the finishing procedures, which involves scraping away as much of the excess slip as I can, and generally just neatening up the shape. And at this point, already, I could tell that I preferred this more slender shape. And I think the more sloped shoulder should lend itself to having a nicer spout springing from it. But this is often how it goes when making a new shape. It takes throwing a few different iterations, and maybe attaching spouts in a few different ways, before you settle on something that you like. And I think that's even more the case when making a style of pot you haven't made before, like these lidless, handleless pourers but I won't really know how well they pour until they've been bisque fired and the clay is hardened to the point where it won't disintegrate anymore. I then thoroughly dry my hands, clasp my hands around the pot and very carefully lift it away. Next, it's time to throw the spout. These are fast objects to make and I throw them off the hump, albeit a small one. This means that I'm only ever working with the very top portion of clay, which is shaped into a narrow spout before being sliced off and delicately moved away. I then continue throwing with the clay that's left below it, making another, then another, then another, until there's no clay left over whatsoever. To throw these, I simply insert an object, be it my finger or the end of a potter's needle, and then I throw the clay up against it, thinning out the walls and creating a more conical, tapering shape. If the rim begins to undulate too much, it isn't a problem, as I can just correct it like I did the vase previously, by slicing the top away with the tip of a needle. To finish it off, I use a curved metal kidney which is carefully run down the outside to remove the slip and to really refine the shape. And as this is my first time making these spouts, for this specific shape of borer, I'll make far more than I actually need and in various shapes too. I'll lean some of them over slightly and others I'll leave perfectly straight. This way I can pick and choose my favourite ones as I'm not entirely sure which ones will work best at this point. The last spout of the hump is never that pretty, but it does give you a good idea of how far this tiny piece of clay can go. I begin by centering it, by forcing it into a shape designated by my fingertips. I then push the finger through the middle, right down to the metal wheel head. Next, I'll begin throwing this clay up against one of my fingers. I then switch from using my finger to a wooden dowel, which I've dipped in water so it doesn't stick to the clay, and then I force the walls of the spout up against it. Once the rough shape is there, I'll begin to remove the slip. This helps the component dry out more quickly and leaves it with a much nicer, sharper finish. Although I will need to be very careful about how I let these dry overnight, as because they're so thin and small, they'll dry out far more quickly than the pots themselves. So I'll need to cover them more carefully overnight, which I usually do by just sticking an upturned pot over them. That way they're completely protected from the environment of the studio. For those of you who aren't potters, after pots have been freshly thrown, they need to be allowed to sit out for a while to turn leather hard. When clay is thrown with, it obviously becomes very wet and saturated with water, and so by leaving it out, moisture can leave the vessel, and gradually, overnight, or over a few days, the pieces will become leather hard. It's only at this point that they can be trimmed and assembled. As if I had tried to pick the pots up like this, just after they had been thrown, they'd simply squash in my hands. And here are the spouts, which I kept underneath an upturned pot, and by the following morning they were still very soft, which is ideal, as it means I'll be able to attach them to the bodies much more easily. There isn't much to trim away from these, rather the shapes just need to be cleaned up somewhat, and of course the bases themselves need to be turned. I start by brushing some slip over the wheel head, and then I place the pot onto it and tap centre it until it's in the middle. Next, I can begin trimming away at the outer walls, moving the sharp tungsten carbide blade up and down, or moving layer by layer, neatening the shape, as well as removing just a bit of weight from the overall thrown form. Once one of the areas has been trimmed over, I'll then burnish over that same area with a very simple piece of flat metal. We used to make these tools in college by cutting up blunted saws and using the opposite straight side rather than the teeth, of course. Typically, I work from the bottom up towards the top, trimming and burnishing as I go. And it's at this point that I really define the sharp edges in between the body and the shoulder 
and the shoulder and the lip. Although, as you can see, spinning around towards the top, there is some kind of impurity lodged in the clay, which seemed to become more prevalent as I work. It's either a lump of porcelain or a lump of plaster. If it's porcelain, it's fine. But if I were to leave a lump of plaster inside the clay body like this and then fire it, it can do something called lime popping, which causes the clay and glaze over it to flake away and fall off. So it's best to just remove it and I plug the hole up with a tiny piece of clay and then burnish over it quickly. I also found that the rim was just a bit too flat and thick for my liking. So I use my smallest tungsten carbide tool just to trim over it and to refine the lip. I then separated the pot from the wheel head and cleaned the metal off so that none of that clay stuck back onto the freshly finished rim. The body of the pourer was then tap centered And then I secured it in place with three lumps of soft clay. The spinner was then positioned on top and through this I apply quite a lot of downward pressure which just helps to keep the pot pinned in place as I work which helps as the neck of this pot is so narrow that trimming this high up and slightly off to the side can cause the whole vessel to tip to one side. After the edge has been beveled I smooth the base then burnish it, and finally I stamp it with my maker's mark. That's the smaller pot trimmed. Now for the taller variant made from a pound and a half of clay, which is done in the exact same way as the previous pot. Once tap centered, I also just seal the base with a rubber kidney, which feels as if it does help keep the pot pinned down more securely. And as this form is made up entirely of straight walls and sharp angles. I use a turning tool that's also completely straight. And then I work my way up from bottom to top, trimming and feeling the cross section as I go. And by attaching the pot to the wheel like this, it means I can trim all the way from the bottom and all the way to the top without any lumps of clay getting in the way or mechanical holding arms, like some devices have. As these do have a delicate rim, I centre the piece as best I can without tap centering it, as hitting the pot so it skids across the metal is also an easy way of damaging the rim. As I press down these lumps of clay, I make sure to grasp the pot firmly, as the process of simply pushing them against the pot can be enough to cause it to shift to one side and thus uncentering the piece. The beveled edge is then turned around the outside and then the very bottom of the pot itself is turned smooth. This rough surface is then burnished and you can see the difference this makes just by how shiny the surface of clay becomes. The clay I use contains a small amount of grog and this process embeds those particles back into the clay whilst also simply polishing it but this mirror-like sheen doesn't last forever. And after the pot has been glaze fired and the clay itself shrinks, it does so around the particles of grog. Thus the surface becomes rough and sharp again. So I polish it very briefly with some wet and dry sandpaper. I then place a wearboard over my wheel so that I can sit working in the same place. I offer the spout up to the vessel and make a mark. Then I remove it and slice away the excess until the angle it protrudes at feels about right. I then squashed out the lower portion of the spout so that it flared out slightly and then I roughly positioned it onto the vessel. I then use a needle to score around this. Then I can remove the spout and begin piercing the hole into the body. Now, admittedly, I didn't have a hole piercer large enough for this job. So I'll show you how I go about it and make it very neat and circular afterwards. I begin by making a rough hole and then I cut away some of the excess all the way around relatively neatly. To really clean it up, I shove a wet sponge on a stick into the hole and spin it in situ a number of times, which once removed leaves a nice neat incision and also softens the clay around it somewhat, which should make attaching the spout a little bit more straightforward. I then score the clay with a serrated kidney and I do the same to the end of the spout. This roughens up the surface and should mean that the clay from both components sticks far more securely to one another, but first, I dab, not brush, slip over the scored area and then I firmly push the spout 
onto the body and I keep pushing until I can see this slit being squeezed out from the join all the way around. I should also note that the spout itself is relatively soft. It certainly isn't leather hard, but it is just about firm enough so that I can hold it and manipulate it without it being deformed too much. I then use the smooth, rounded side of one of my hole pierces to fettle all the way around the spout, blending in some of that excess clay into the body of the pourer. I'll keep blending until it's sealed all the way around. And thereafter I switch back to my sponge on a stick to really smooth over the clay and to blend the join, making it seamless. As I am using a slightly grogged stoneware body, as I sponge the surface, it removes the softer clay, leaving harder particles of sand in its place. So after the pot has been sponged, I'll go back over the surface with a smooth metal rod just to burnish it nice and smooth once again. And after this, to make sure they don't crack, I'll wrap these up with plastic and spray them with water so that both components can dry out to the same consistency, which should prevent any cracks forming around the join. Now, after attaching this, I think the angle is slightly off and I wasn't entirely happy with this spout, but I think I have a few ideas about how to improve it in my next attempt. But lastly, as the process of spouting it usually means that I move the vessel quite a lot on the wooden board, this can result in the base of the pot being slightly marked and damaged. So I give it one quick burnish like so, upside down. And here's my second attempt. And you'll see that the shoulder section of this pot is a bit steeper which I think will make how the spout protrudes look quite a bit better. So once again, I offer the spout up, make a mark on it, and then cut away any excess. This spout was a little thick towards the bottom, so I quickly cut away most of that, and then use my fingertip to smooth off the inside, and once again, flare out this bottom section just to touch. And then take it and roughly position it on the pot, which this time just works as it's springing from that slope at almost a right angle. And then score around the spout, remove it, and once again make a hole. I cut away to make the hole just a touch bigger, and a new set of larger hole pierces has been added to my list of tools that need to be ordered. I then take the wet sponge on a stick, place it into the hole, and then rotate it in situ. As the hole wasn't quite round enough for my liking, I then inserted the tapering handle of one of my turning tools and rotated it in place, which left a much nicer hole. I then scored the clay around it and fixed it again as it was a bit messy. And then slip is coated onto both components. And the reason I previously said that I dab it rather than brush it is because by dabbing it, I don't smooth over and soften any of those incised marks, rather the slip is just resting over them and seeping into the scratches. I then do the same for the spout and then firmly push the two pieces together. And as I hold the spout and press it onto the body, I'm not pinching with my fingers in so much, rather I'm pushing down through it. Wiggling the spout as I push doesn't hurt too, as it helps meld together all those scratched marks and the slip. And as the clay is still relatively soft, I can position it the angle of my liking. I then take this small metal rod and once again go all the way around, blending in the join. And as I flare the base of the spout out just a little bit, it means I can blend the clay in without having to take away too much material from the length of the spout itself, nor do I have to add any clay around it to make the curve more generous. But if you do have to do either of those things, it can help waiting until the spout has dried out somewhat, as if I were to add soft clay to the damp portion of the lower half of the spout and try and push it in to fill in any gaps. There's a chance I could deform the spout itself and it can be quite hard to rectify nicely. It's also amazing how much of a difference using the sponge on a stick makes. I mean, of course it can be any sponge, but the shape of this one really does help blend in all those smudged and smeared making marks. And at the same time as it does literally remove clay, if there are any raised bumps or lumps or tiny inconsistencies you aren't happy with, fettling away like this can do a wonderful job of evening out the surface. Once I've gone over it with my fingers, I then switch to the metal again, which does a much better job at pushing all those burrs back into the surface of the body. And that's more or less it for the second variant, and I prefer it so much more compared to the first one. It's finer, 
taller, a bit more elegant, and the spout springs from the vessel at a much nicer angle. But I'm glad when making these, I threw various shapes and sizes so that I could find what works best. And once again, lastly, I place the pot back upside down onto the wheel head and burnish over any areas that might have been affected during the spouting process. And that's the pot finished for now. The next step will be slowly drying it out until it's bone dry, and then I'll bisque fire it, glaze it, and then reduction fire it. But those are all parts of the process that are yet to happen. So if you want to, subscribe. And in the future, I'll make videos that show the rest of this process as they happen over the coming weeks and months. The very last thing I do is wrap the pots up tightly in plastic, and I let the wet spouts slowly dry and acclimatize to the rest of the pots so that they don't crack or split. Thanks so much for watching, as always, especially if you're one of the few who make it through to the end. It really does mean the world to me. And by watching these videos I create, you do really help support me and my studio as they cover much of my rent, my bills, and my raw material costs. That's all, and I'll see you next week.